Baby drive that hot fuzz over here. It's the end of the world, so let's hit the Winchester, because we're all about to die. Or maybe just get turned into coins. Welcome to Channel 8 and a Half. Hello, and thank you for joining us at Channel 8 and a Half, a show about movies and TV and pop culture. My name is Joe Galino. And my name is Andrew Hanna. Andrew, how are you doing, sir? I am doing all right. Yes, I'm going to drive that pun into the ground as today we cover one of my favorite directors, Edgar Wright. It is the 10 year anniversary of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and a mm-hmm. perfect time to explore a master of the craft. Best known for his Cornetto trilogy, Edgar Wright is in essence a genre director. He covered zombies with Shaun of the Dead, buddy cop films with Hot Fuzz, aliens with The World's End, comic book adaptation with Scott Pilgrim, and Getaway Driver Heist with Baby Driver. Wright's films are both reverent of their respective genres, yet comedically self-aware of the tropes that define them. Joe, I thought a good start to this episode, the first of which we explore one director's body of work, Mm -hmm. is to rank their films from least favorite to most favorite. This may not work with some of the more prolific directors in the future episodes, but uh, given Wright's relatively young career, how would you rank his films and to clarify not his best as far as filmmaking goes but your favorite your just favorites. favorites exactly i wanted to come up with some sort of a deviation from the norm wanted to give you something shocking mm-hmm. but it's not gonna be man <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> have probably the same list that you and a lot of other people do there's not gonna be a lot of shocks to this one so yeah. there's only five to really think of or to look at. Yeah. I did not count his very, very first movie, A Fistful of Quarters, made in 1995, that you can really only see on YouTube in like grainy footage. Yeah, I, I looked in, it up uh, during the research for this. And uh, yeah, it's it's definitely one of the ones you can leave out. You can see the style of Edgar Wright, though, even within that, even though it is clearly made by someone who is very young and it's very cheap you can still see the trademarks of the the close shots the tight the whip pans all of that it is there well and also just the the nature of the film is very much a reference or kind of homage yeah it's an homage to to past works which which in essence is his style he well it is a it's a western parody yeah exactly, exactly and i remember listening to him talk with kevin smith of clerk's fame and other things fame about Edgar Wright watching clerks and going, Oh, that's such a genius idea. Just shoot a movie where you work. Cause you're already there. And Edgar yeah. Wright was talking about his first movie, a fistful of fingers. He's like, I want to do this Western and these people on horseback. And I was like, this is stupid. I should have just shot a movie in my house. Like Kevin Smith did. <laughs> which he, I guess he did with Shaun of the Dead <laughs> which kind of yeah if you really think yeah. about it I mean Spaced yeah. is that way too I didn't mm-hmm. count Spaced in this I didn't count his TV work but Spaced is also wonderful yeah, yeah. but it is really that even though he didn't write that um, Jessica Hines and Shaun his, his name's not Shaun his name is he's in Shaun of the Dead he plays <laughs> Shaun oh Simon Pegg Jessica Hines and Simon Pegg wrote all of Spaced and Edgar Wright directed it but I didn't count that. Yeah, It makes sense because Simon Pegg is his writing partner on a lot of these films. Mm-hmm. And Simon Pegg really suffers without the presence of Edgar Wright. You can tell when Paul, he wrote Paul with Nick Frost, who's also in a lot of these mm-hmm. movies. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff that he does write does suffer a lot without Edgar Wright. It feels as though when you have a comedic actor writing a film, it turns out a lot like the comedic films that we see nowadays where it's it's a lot of ad lib it's kind of a jumbled mess of jokes with very little structure uh, as far as storytelling goes and and I feel like they're the perfect duo or or the perfect collaboration in these films is because Simon Pegg has a great understanding of comedy and comedic timing and then Edgar Wright knows how to translate that onto screen because everything in an Edgar Wright movie is so tight and oh every God. script most things in them, especially when we get into later, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz. Yeah. Everything pays off yes. in them. I have, I was, everything. Yeah, I'm actually going to mention that. Yeah. But nevertheless, we've beat around the bush 
enough already. <laughs> the people listening are like, shut up and just give me the list. That's what we want. This is the internet. We want lists of things. <laughs> and so I will tell you, starting off at number five is The World's End, the third movie in the Cornetto trilogy. Yep. And when I say it's my least favorite of Edgar Wright's body of work, mm -hmm. it's still better than most things out there. It's unfair. It makes it sound worse than it is when I say, oh yeah, the thing that I like the least of his is still really great. Yeah. But it didn't catch me. It didn't grab me the way that all of his other stuff did. It was mm -hmm. very morose in mm -hmm. tone. I mean, the main yeah. character, he, you know, tried to commit suicide and yeah. he's going back into this town and he's become a loser. And they're, the whole movie is them, him trying to recreate a pub crawl that he started with his friends decades ago yeah, as a way to kind of relive his past glory. And while that's happening, an alien invasion also happens. Yeah. But it just didn't catch me it wasn't as fun as mm. his previous films this yeah. came after scott pilgrim but before baby driver and so i think that my problem that i had with it was a problem of expectation i wanted it to be so much greater than it was and that's what led me to be disappointed but it's still really really good well that's the thing is edgar wright movies are always a fun ride and leave you in high spirits e even in Shaun of the Dead where Nick Frost is still a zombie at the end but but they're still together exactly and he tends to keep things lighthearted but with the world's end it, it makes you feel terrible yeah it does yeah it's depressing which is why I have a hard time going back to it in an effort to appreciate it but like you said despite it being ranked last on my list I still feel as though it told a better story than most original films that come out these days. It was well-directed, well-written, and was a good film overall. You can see the growth in his filmmaking, though, in The World's End especially. All the things that he learned on Scott Pilgrim, especially in the fight scenes, the fight choreography, mm -hmm. really translated over into The World's End and into Baby Driver. Yeah, yeah. And I appreciate that with each of his films, you see him refine his style more and more and that he'll utilize elements he developed for a past film and then implement them in a different genre he's exploring. It, you can easily pick out the moments he enjoyed in his previous films that he wanted to further explore. A prime example is the scene in Shaun of the Dead where they're beating the zombie in the bar to the beat of Don't Stop Me Now by Queen and then carrying that aspect of action in sync with music into baby driver and then just scaling it up to the entire film so what is number four for you then scott pilgrim is probably number four for me oh this is where we deviate good yeah y you hear me talk a lot about story informing style and aesthetic and scott pilgrim does this in the best way possible he was able to weave in the experience of a graphic novel in the form of film which could easily be cheesy but I think he just nails it. And there are personal reasons as to why this is my fourth, only because the the other three films have kind of a special place in my heart. But yeah, Scott Pilgrim sits at, at number four for me. Scott Pilgrim sits at number three for me. Sitting at number four is Baby Driver. But let's continue yeah. talking about Scott Pilgrim. Because it's this far down on the list because I do think that story is a little bit weak underneath the incredible visuals. I think this is one of the most incredible things to look at that I've ever seen. I saw it in the theater twice. Mm -hmm. I remember walking out of it going, I've never seen anything like this before. I agree. It was visually striking. And more than anything, I, I love the references to video games that he features. Did, did you play Zelda's Ocarina of Time? No, I did not play any of the Zelda games. I also wasn't a big Mario person. Between the video game references and the visual style, it was just so interesting to watch. And it made you excited to go back and watch it again. And at its base, it's about dating a new person and how to deal with the baggage and his battles with her Quite past. Literally. and. Quite yeah, literally, literally, it's fight scenes. So all of her, all of Ramona's ex-girlfriends, the girlfriend of Scott Pilgrim in the movie, her ex-boyfriends are considered the League of Evil Exes, and they fight Scott Pilgrim in order for Scott to win her heart. Which is kind of a, I don't want to use the word problematic word, because that's a word that gets thrown out all the time. But, you know, maybe not great in terms of uh, progressive thinking. 
I well, I think here's the thing is is he is very much a character who lives his life by the things he consumes, the art, whether it's some music, uh, movies, or video games that he plays. And so it makes sense that in his mind he's translating. It's a lot like 500 Days of Summer in that the way that his mind works is the way that the film is structured. And so they're not real fights; they're all metaphors. Exactly, and it, they're metaphorical fights. It makes sense that in his head that they're playing out like a video game, which I I think is a lot of fun. I mean, just the way that you can feel the the tone shift right before he's about to meet an ex Mm -hmm. is the same way when you're playing a video game and the music starts kind of getting slower and then there's a save point you're like oh i'm about to fight someone and then somebody yells out scott pilgrim and then it cuts (laughs) to the the two eyes both of them on the same frame vertically yeah Uh, i'm sorry horizontally cut like that it is very much a video game type movie though too it's a i mean it would be a wonderful video game adaptation because it's shot that way Oh, definitely. Definitely. And, and you know, like when he goes to pee and then he comes out of the door and he's in the hallway and then mm-hmm. the Zelda theme is playing. And you're that just... was done practically, by the way, that bit with oh, yeah. the, going to the bathroom and then changing in the backgrounds. Yeah, the uh, the set was on wheels. Right. And they just yeah. uh, they they moved it around, which I thought was just so cool. And, and that's something that that stands out in Edgar Wright's films is the practicality of it. Is Most of this. So great. A lot of this was done practically. Mm-hmm. A whole bunch of this movie, there's obviously visual effects laid on top of it with all of the video game references, the coins, like the P-bar when he goes to the bathroom. Obviously, yeah, yeah. that's not there. But a lot of the fight scenes and a lot of the camera blocking the movement, that's all done on the set. You can tell it makes all the difference. Baby Driver was mostly all practical. The actors were mm-hmm. in the car reacting in real time to the chase scenes. There's a great interview where Christopher Nolan is interviewing Wright about Baby Driver when it yeah. first came out. And Wright was talking about the practical reaction shots in the car and that at one point one of the actors grabbed the oh shit handle and he thought to himself is he doing that as the actor playing the character or is he actually really freaked out and you wouldn't get that if they were just in front of a green screen and that's something that Edgar Wright goes to great lengths of accomplishing in his films is shooting as much in camera as possible but I think Scott Pilgrim, to me, stands apart from the rest of his films in a way. And maybe it's because it's his only film that isn't his own original concept. It's also the biggest budget he's ever had. Yeah, yeah. This was a notorious flop when it came Mm -hmm. out. It lost a lot of money. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't see it when it first came out. But I I did get to see it at a screening at the New Beverly. And Edgar Wright was there. And he did a QA, and a which was really cool. Brie Larson was there, too. She was showing her short film. Brie Larson's so great in this movie. She was perfectly cast. Everybody in this movie is perfectly cast, too. I agree. Yeah. And that's what he does. Edgar Wright does that. He casts so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody Mm -hmm. in Scott Pilgrim. I love Kieran Culkin in it. Everything that he says, I think, is golden. When When they're interrupting the crash in the boys set and he just turns to his date uh and he goes oh love this one and just hits him on the shoulder real quick (laughs) oh it's brilliant well and it's after they say uh hey dude we shut up we we hate you or something like that or shut up and die yeah (laughs) Yeah, exactly ellen wong too ellen wong too is an incredible find she was the breakout performance of this movie she played knives yeah she was so amazing to me i think she did a great job where her character Her character could have easily become very annoying and irritating, but she played it off very well. And Scott was supposed to end up with her in the original edit. Oh, really? Yes. Did you read the... uh, I did not read the book. I I didn't read read it. I hear it's good. Apparently, it's really good. She and Scott were supposed to end up together in the end. And then in the kind of the middle of shooting, they decided to rework it so that Scott and Ramona are the ones that end up together. But I think you can really tell. I think you can absolutely tell that Scott and Knives were the original end couple for this because they give Knives so much more development. She has more screen time. She has the biggest kind of character change in this entire thing. Yeah. Uh, Do you feel like you could tell because that's what we've been conditioned to believe? Like A lot of times in these types of films, it's like, oh, it was a girl in front of you all along or... You know, he ends up with the girl that that is nice and sweet and sort of, you know. No, I think I feel like that because with the direction that the actors are giving are mm-hmm. given, Knives is much more likable than Ramona. And Ramona was given the direction. Mary Elizabeth Winstead, the actress playing Ramona, was given the direction to say her lines kind of flat, yeah. to be very monochromatic in her delivery or monosyllabic in her delivery. 
in order for at the end when she and Scott don't end up together, Scott says, oh, well, I guess I kind of didn't understand her to begin with. We just mm-hmm. didn't, weren't in sync, whereas he and Knives very much are in sync the whole movie. And she ends up growing as a person, too, by the end to say, I maybe don't need you either. Yeah. And so maybe Scott should have just ended up alone. <laughs> I I honestly think (laughs) that's what he deserved, but she definitely relates to him more than Ramona does. All of Scott's friends are very high schoolish, which makes sense. They've just graduated high school and they're kind of in their early 20s, but they've only existed in their familiar hometown, whereas Ramona seems as though she's been on her own for a lot longer. She's lived in more places and because she lived in New York, a, a more harsh place, especially compared to Canada. Yeah. So she had to embody a more mature stature and exactly all of that adds to her mystery, which I think is the main reason Scott is attracted to her. She's just kind of an object to be desired by Scott. But what he doesn't realize is that she is nothing like him, right? N- neither an in interest or general maturity. I, I think probably the, they're most similar in that they're terrible in relationships Mm -hmm. and always end up breaking up with people yet they're helpless when it comes to the only people that broke up with them, which is a very immature thing in a way. So yeah, I I don't think they necessarily relate on any other level. They even physically look awkward together at that party though. One, one of my favorite actors showed up, uh, and I can't oh, remember his name. From New Girl. Guy. From New Girl. His name yeah. is Como. And he knows everybody. And when he showed up, I kind of forgot that he was in this. And I go, oh. <laughs> I really like that guy, too. <laughs> he has such an understated role, but he is a lot of fun when he's on screen. Oh, I, I, that, I, like, I like that actor a lot. Right when he showed up, he plays Robbie in New Girl. And I went, oh, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where he plays like the nerdy looking dude but is also very kind of chill in a very Mm -hmm. unfathomable way you're like what why are you so cool you look like a nerd what the hell (laughs) you want to know something weird do you know the the podcast welcome to night vale yes yeah when i think of the guy behind that voice i think of that actor and i don't know why i would have to listen to it again i have no clue why their voices are not the same at all the welcome to night vale guy is very deep yeah don't know why that's who you imagine is that's who i imagine is behind the voice of welcome to night vale that is very interesting even though the guy who actually is the voice of welcome to night vale does not look anything like that at all hey guys whoever's listening to this that doesn't know us go ahead and (laughs) tell us what you think we look like (laughs) please be kind or be mean anything that gives us comments or like say whatever whatever you want yeah say whatever you want down there as long as it's five stars you can say whatever you want (laughs) i just shoved a man off the back of a train five stars yeah great review (laughs) You know, you know who's also in this though. A new girl actor is the first ex, uh, is Shireng. Is that really him? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name is uh, Satya Baba, and he plays Shireng in New Girl. And I did not know this until I looked it up. Literally, yeah, I had no after clue. I watched it this weekend because you, you can't tell with his eyeshadow no. and all of that. Mm-mm. That's interesting. That's so odd. Yeah, I, I feel like maybe a uh, new girl is actually Scott Pilgrim. But in disguise, for the, yeah, in disguise <laughs> because they're all CC's exes. <laughs> but that was my that was your number four. Yes, and it was that's my number three. So let's move on to, to my, number my number three and four. your number four. Exactly. Let's just confuse everybody. Yeah, which is Baby Driver. Yes. Now you like Baby Driver, I think, quite a bit more than I do. I do. You would like Baby Driver, though. I understand why you like Baby Driver a lot because I know you very well. You are a very musically inclined person and this movie is all about music. Exactly. The entire opening sequence is him walking down the street to music. Everything, there's very little of this movie has no music in it at all. And you are a dancer. You are a wonderfully majestic dancer. (laughs) Oh, I appreciate that, Joe. (laughs) You glide across the floor like Natalie Portman in Black Swan. (laughs) Doesn't she kill herself at the end of that movie? (laughs) <laughs> Doesn't matter, Andrew. The point is that you're a man of music and rhythm. But I understand why you like this movie a little bit more than I do. Yeah, and I think that definitely is. The whole iPod scoring your life is a thing that I used to do when I was younger. And I still do sometimes, whether it was when I was first dating Christina. I would make a playlist before we'd sit in my car and talk for hours. Same thing with with my friends. We always had a joke that my iPod always knew what song to play because the song always corresponded with what we were talking. There was that one point where I got 
so many tickets within one month, <laughs> speeding yeah, tickets. I remember that, that. I had to change the type of music I was playing because the music would hype me up so much that I would think I was in a movie for some reason. Stupid. You just went from death metal to Michael Bolton very yeah, quickly. Yeah, exactly. I had to switch the podcasts and audiobooks for a while to, to save a bit of money. But I am very much a person who likes to score my life. If you look at my Spotify and the playlist, I, I can tell you exactly what was happening in my life at the time that I was making a specific playlist. And I'm sure I'm not alone, but there are some songs and even sense and things like that that remind you of a certain chapter in your life. 100%. It brings you back to that memory, to that place. Not just the memory, but to the place, to the time, you can remember where you were. Yeah, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head as to the reason I love this movie, considering how musically driven I am. It's an incredibly put together heist as well. Not just the gimmick of the scoring the entire thing to pop songs. It's also a really well put together heist, and the action scenes are incredible. The driving sequences, it's about a driver. The driving sequences are amazing. And how many driving movies and chase scenes have we seen where just when you think you've seen it all, he was still able to make you go, whoa, that was cool. Mm -hmm. That first chase scene, for instance, where he reverses and then whips around all the while the camera is tracking the car only to have the car drift into the foreground as the camera zooms out and he stays with him. So you see this entire action play out. He's not mm -hmm. always cutting from shot to shot. And so it feels more real and, and realistic. You're, you're not only in awe of the driving, but the camera work itself is insane. I, I would say he created a car chase film, I dare to say it, far superior than Fast and the Furious. It's much more realistic, even though it is unrealistic in that way. Because yeah. any, any car chase movie is kind of going to be unrealistic. But Fast and the Furious is too much. They're godlike figures. They're yeah. Driving cars off of buildings that magically float. Mm-hmm. You know, they can't die. They're they're pulling behind a safe and it's just banging through wherever. And they go, yeah. well, this is fine. We're all fine yeah. with this. <laughs> yeah. No, Baby Driver did exist in a world that was real. Is that what your problem maybe with Scott Pilgrim is? Not your problem, but you know what I mean. Is that Scott Pilgrim does not exist in the real world, whereas everything else that he's done does exist in some semblance of the, of the real world, even when aliens are attacking in the world's end? No, I... I wouldn't say that because I did connect with Scott Pilgrim a lot in that I myself will view my experiences through the lens of movies, music, books, and uh, video games. So it isn't lower on my list because of anything it did wrong. It was that I connected with the films that I ranked above it just a little bit more. And with Baby Driver, it wasn't only the action sequences. I, I thought the love story was really good. I was about to ask you about this. What did you think of the romance subplot of this movie? They both had just great chemistry in it, and it felt very real and natural. I loved Lily James in this. I thought she was so charming. And with Baby, I think it's a cool character trait that a lot of the things that Baby says to Deborah are quotes from a movie that was on the TV in the background of his apartment or things that other characters have said, like John Hamm. And, and because he is a maker of mixtapes, mm -hmm. It makes sense that he would borrow phrases from other sources in order to express himself, even in just normal conversation. I also think that the fact that they bonded over music, which, of course, has been done so many times before with Garden State and 500 Days of Summer, and it's become kind of a new trope in romantic movies. But it's another reason I love this movie, because from a personal standpoint, Christina and I first bonded over music and when we began dating we would create playlists for each other it was also one of the first movies i took her to see in theater so i definitely have kind of a personal connection or a personal bias toward the movie because of the memories that are attributed to it what did you think of ansel elgort as a main lead did you think he carried the movie well yes i i think he was believable as the quiet mysterious character where he looked young, but he could also pull off the fact that he's a great driver, all while still hitting Edgar Wright's comedic beats. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that he's a really nice contrast to, because at first I did not like him. At first I thought he was too jarring as this character to fit in with these very gruff and very sort of almost scuzzy looking types yeah. of people. John Barenthal's character, John Hamm's character, and a very aggressive haircut. Yeah. And then I realized that he was the perfect person to play that type of character because he fit out. He, yeah, because of the juxtaposition. Because yeah. he stood out so much from them. 
Yeah, it definitely worked given his character is meant to be sort of out of place in that environment. So we're on to number two. And now here's what I'm curious too. My number two is Shaun of the Dead. Okay. My number two is Hot Fuzz. Oh, this has more differences than I thought there was going to be. But I know that I I know that you love zombies, and so I'm not surprised that Shaun of the Dead is number one for you. But that's good. It, yeah. It, again, it's personal favorite. Shaun of the Dead mm-hmm. had such an impact on me in high school. It was very different than a lot of the things that I had seen. It was just, it was fun. You can tell the filmmakers were having a lot of fun while making it. And I actually made a short film as an homage to it and turned it into for film class called At Random. And it was quite literally, I mean, it, we at one point quoted the film multiple times. And But the movie has just such a special place in my heart. It breathes so much life into the zombie genre, even now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so much of zombies has been done to death and even at that time dawn the dead had just come out 28 days later had just come out yeah what Shaun of the dead did was take parody of the genre to such a intricate extreme and it's also so funny it's an amazing zombie film and this is what we're going to talk about or i wanted to talk about with hot fuzz as well which is kind of amazing it could be both an incredible entry in the genre in Shaun of the dead it's zombies and hot fuzz it's action movies while also being an incredible parody of the genre. And that's what I mean by his films are both reverent and hilariously self-aware of the tropes attributed to that specific genre he's covering. And though he's satirizing the genre, it never feels like he's making fun of it. He loves the genre. Exactly. It felt like he was honoring it, not necessarily disparaging it in the way that some parodies do. And at a young age, when my films were mostly referential to the movies I grew up on or that I was watching at the time, to see that there was a place for that type of film was cool. And what had the most impact on me was his ability to tell a great story on such a low budget. You got this impression that he was just a guy who got a bunch of friends together and shot a film in his backyard, which was inspiring to see as a young filmmaker. Up until that point, low budget indie films in my mind, at least the ones that I had seen, were primarily dramas. Mm -hmm. But as a kid, I wanted to make cool, high concept films. And this was able to maintain the fun and excitement in a zombie movie with limited resources. Because it is so simple. Really, the story of it is incredibly simple. Sean goes and decides they need to go to the Winchester to hold out for the zombie apocalypse. He goes, picks up his girlfriend, picks up his mom, and they go to the bar. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. But it's so intricately well made and crafted, and the structure of it is remarkable. Everything pays off in a way in Shaun of the Dead, and it does in Hot Fuzz too. Yeah. In this great way. I think it's kind of a perfect screenplay. It's a perfect story. I agree. The The great thing about his films is the plant and payoff, but also his ability to find those little comedic moments in a scene that are so hilarious and memorable. Like the part where they come into contact with the first zombie and they're trying to talk to her, but she attacks them. And then they push her over and she impales herself. And then they go, oh. Yeah. And all you, okay? you hear at that moment is the clicking of Nick Frost winding up a disposable camera. And that moment, as simple as it is, is one of my favorite moments. And it's hilarious. And he packs so much into a scene that you don't notice until later viewings. I mean, everything in Scott Pilgrim and Hot Fuzz, all of them have stuff going on in the background. That's what makes them so rewatchable, too. They're incredibly rewatchable, not just because they're a lot of fun to be with and to hang around in the world, but also because there's so much going into every frame. Yeah, I don't think I've ever felt as though, oh, I don't want to watch this again when I'm wanting to show one of his films Mm -hmm. to to a friend or a family member. I'm excited because I know that now I can focus on trying to find the other things in the background. Scott Pilgrim takes that to an nth degree, too. You know, all the X's have a number appear on screen Mm -hmm. that corresponds with their number, with which X they are. Uh, Except for five and six. I had to look this up because I was looking for the numbers while I was watching it. Five and six don't five and six. They turn the amplifier up to 11, five and six, add them together. You get 11. And that's the number reference for them. Oh yeah, that's right. I did not catch that. And I had to look it up later. See, I love that. We're still noticing things even now, but yeah, Shaun of the Dead has a special place in my heart. It feels like the spaced movie. 
Did you watch Spaced? I watched, I think, a few scenes, like the scene where they're having the shootout on you the sidewalk. Di- you would dig Spaced. Yeah, I've, I've heard great things about Spaced. I, I, should, I should go and, and check it out. And that's where the impetus of Shaun of the Dead came from, is that there is an episode that is a zombie homage episode in Spaced. And then Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg and all of them were going, well, why don't we just do this as a movie? Oh, cool. But my number one, it is Hot Fuzz. And I'm, they're so close for me because I love yeah. Shaun of the Dead so much. I also love Hot Fuzz so much, but I think I love Hot Fuzz more because it is so meticulous in yeah. structure, mm-hmm. in blocking, in all of it. And I think it is the perfect example of becoming a a great entrant in the genre and yeah. also parody. It is very refined and meticulous, like you Incredible. said. There, there, there isn't anything that's wasted. I mean, that, that's what I love about Edgar Wright, and we can talk about it when we talk about his style. But I, believe it or not, didn't appreciate Hot Fuzz when I first saw it. It definitely grew on me so much so that it's now in my number two spot. And it would be my number one spot if it wasn't for the impact that Shauna Dead had on me as a filmmaker. But there hasn't been one viewing of Hot Fuzz that I haven't noticed something new. I had no idea that Peter Jackson was the Santa Claus. Yes, you know he that? is. Uh-huh. And then Kate Blanchett is his girlfriend his in the girlfriend crime scene. The beginning. And then there was something else that popped in my head. Um, oh, I, lo- <laughs> I love in the play. <laughs> Which I think is great that he's just taking a crack at a fellow filmmaker from the same generation. But the Romeo and Juliet play is actually a rendition of the Boz Lerman Romeo and Juliet, (laughs) (laughs) which I think is so is so great for someone who's just so cheesy and a terrible actor. Of course, they would choose that as a rendition. (laughs) Well, that's what I love about this, though, is that it takes a jab at not just action movies, you know, bad boys, point break, yeah. but it also takes a jab at small town English murders that are so popular and they're so popular, especially yeah. on the BBC. And the reasons why these people were murdered are so banal <laughs> that it's laughable. And everybody, it's set up in such a perfect mystery Agatha Christie style story. Of yeah. Everybody has a motivation for why the people who get killed should be killed and by, you know, different people in the town and then the reason a legitimate yeah, a legitimate conspiracy reason. of land and a highway and things like that exactly and then the reasons why they get murdered one is a bad actor right that's the only yeah. reason they got murdered they go well yeah. he was he was bad in the play one yeah. was a really great florist and they just didn't want her to go one no. had an annoying laugh one was a house that was just too gaudy and they go well yeah. his, his house is too big can't have yeah. that and then one had bad grammar those are the reasons why the people who get murdered get murdered yeah. and that's hilarious to me that it was set up so meticulously to i've said the word meticulous a lot in this episode and i think that's okay because the, edgar he Wright is meticulous is i mean so yeah, meticulous it, yeah it's hard to get around that but all of all of the clues are there to go this is the reason why this person should be murdered and then it's just so boring yeah of exactly. a reason it's so childish and just yes. insignificant just petty i love that nick frost is the polar opposite of Simon Pegg's mm-hmm. character, but he's the only one that sort of admires him and looks up to him. And everything that Simon Pegg says to him, he ends up mimicking immediately sometimes where someone comes up to Nick Frost and he says, what happened? He says, oh, it was a car accident. And then Simon Pegg says, oh, we don't call them accidents because that implies that there's no one to blame. You mm-hmm. call them traffic collisions. Yeah. And so immediately after someone walks up and says, oh, what happened? And he says, oh, it's a traffic collision. And it's just so adorable. Like, <laughs> And then that comes back as an emotional moment too when talking about his mom and when his mom dies and how does she die traffic yeah. collision traffic collision mm-hmm. but i also love that when nicholas angel orders a beer for the first time he says yeah roy and that's from shot of the dead when he says yeah boy and I'm just like it's things like that i didn't notice that before and i was watching and i was like oh my god that's the fences so bit. funny the fe- i mean yeah there's that through line and through um, all three of the movie Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and then World's the End. Cornetto, yeah, the Cornetto trilogy, off. yeah. He's also taking a crack at American action films. Oh, yeah. If you notice, just no one dies. None of the bad guys get killed when they get shot. No, they're Nicholas all injured. Angel, they're all injured. He wings yeah. them, he shoots the guns out of their hands, but he yeah. does not kill them. 
which is the antithesis of American action mm-hmm. films, and uh, which I I appreciate in a way, but I also love that it's ironic when I forgot what his name is, but Nick Frost's father in the movie says, Jim uh, it's, character. "Yeah, it's time to make Sanford great again." And I'm like, "Oh, yes, damn that and that this age came out in like 2007. wine." Yeah, it's so bizarre. This movie predicted a lot of stuff that the kids in hoodies who mm-hmm. are terrorizing the town that all of the townspeople are afraid of. And they go, Oh, yeah. we can't have these kids wearing hoodies. There's a lot of stuff in here that was, there's no way they could have planned that. They couldn't know it. There's no way, but it's just weird how it worked out. And I just thought about this. It is actually very similar to the girl with all the gifts in that it is also about sort of the generational gap. Mm-hmm. All the cops in the department are the young generation in the village. And they end up turning on the elders who are trying to maintain the status quo by any means necessary. Which is a nice mirror to Nicholas Angel's growth as a person. You know, he's so straight laced in the beginning. He's so rigid and by the book with his thinking. And he goes, no, we have to do the right thing all the time, no matter what. And then he gets transferred to this town where people take what they think is doing the right thing to the extreme. Uh And it really shows, oh, maybe I can lighten up a bit. (laughs) But he also ends up being right the whole time (laughs) because he keeps telling Danny that, there's danger around every corner. And then when Danny is uh, pointing out, you know, in the town when they're just, you know, wandering around, driving around, he goes, what do you think is under that trench coat? A shotgun? And Simon Pegg goes, no, it's not. And then he ends up having a shotgun under that at the end. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There were some great deaths in this. I love the journalist getting his head crushed in by the spire of the church. That is just amazing visual of just watching that thing crush his spine and and that his body sort of you know tumbles it doesn't immediately just crush Mm -mm. him it really is more gory than i remembered it being yeah it is but he he set that precedence with shaun of the dead as well exactly yeah so that's my number one i can't think of anything i was trying to think about this too of great parodies that are also great entries in the genre itself that it's parodying. I could not think of a lot of them. Like Black Dynamite is a great parody of black exploitation, but it's not a great crime movie. And a lot of those black exploitation movies that it was parodying are crime movies first. It was parodying yeah. film like the filmmaking of black exploitation with the boom operator kind of dipping into frame. Yeah, yeah. And things like that. Monty Python and the Holy Grail we talked about last week. It's a great comedy and it is a great Arthurian legend because there is a lot of in there, but I would never call it a great action movie or something like that of whatever genre Arthurian legends are. Uh, I think hot shots, hot shots, hot shots. with the one like that action I, movies. Yeah. The Even one that scary I can, movie, ah, but it's not a horror movie. Like, Scream, oh, you're saying yeah? That, no, that I'm saying still... that it can be both. That's yeah, what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Scream is trying to be that a parody yeah. and a horror movie, but it's definitely more of a horror movie. I wouldn't call it a parody in that it's funny. The one that I could come up with that can be both is Shrek. Shrek is both a parody of fairy tales and a great fairy tale story. No, I agree. That's actually a good point. That was the yeah. one that I could come up with. Yeah, but because there's not a lot. I mean, Mel Brooks does parody as great as anybody cabin in the woods did you see cabin in the woods yeah i like that a lot cabin in the woods i thought of too because that's mostly a comedy you can you can do that fairly easily with horror films i think yeah it seems like it i think most horror films especially these days are a combination of comedy and horror even shawn of the dead had some pretty freaky moments and not not in the traditional sense, but like when he turns on the light and they're all at the door. Mm-hmm. So do you remember the bathroom in my in my house downstairs? How it looked out and how there was a giant window on the door and how your yeah, dog and would it looked jump out up to the backyard. You? Yeah. So every time I turned on that light, it looked that little like nook that he goes into looks exactly like that bathroom. And so I would freak out right. every time I turned the light that I always put down the shade before I went in because I was like, I don't want to see what's on the other well. side. <laughs> but I think leading into the next segment that we wanted to cover is sort of the lens through which we, you and I, Joe, often look at directors' bodies of work, specifically our tours or highly stylized directors like Edgar Wright, which is what is the most Edgar Wright film? What is the best Edgar Edgar Wright film? And what does Edgar Wright derailed look like? But before we go into that, I feel as though it might be first to talk about sort of his style and what we love about it. What makes an Edgar Wright film to you and, and what do you like about them? 
very quick cuts, very kinetic energy, pop culture references is really what I look at and really, really funny. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? I think Edgar Wright is one of the few directors that uses every single element of cinema to tell his story. True. I mean, not one element is neglected. Color, music, sound design, blocking, dialogue, everything. If, if a character says one thing, one line, it will almost always, like you said, pay off later. And though his films usually are action comedies, he doesn't neglect the dialogue in the way that other films, other action films do as just something to get through to get to the next action sequence. Mm -hmm. Overall, I think my favorite thing about his his style is that it's a very apparent that the filmmakers are having fun while they're making this film. In your opinion, what is the most Edgar Wright film? The most Edgar Wright to me is Scott Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much going on in terms of the visuals, the visual effects, the action, the stunts, the choreography. It is the most Edgar Wright that you could possibly have on the screen. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. It, it was between that and Baby Driver, only because Baby Driver had a lot of elements that he's used in the past culminating in this one film. I think my the main caveat with Baby Driver was the fact that it was probably his most sincere films. It felt less satirical than his other films. The most earnest? Yeah, exactly. And so I, I, I would definitely agree that Scott Pilgrim is the most Edgar Wright film. I think what makes... Scott Pilgrim, to me, the most Edgar Wright is the pop culture references. Yes, exactly. Every single frame of this is a reference to something, whether it's the the Zelda theme that you mentioned earlier playing, whether there's references to individual shots, the Mortal Kombat. Every time one of the fights starts, there's the Mortal Kombat set up. Just everything in there is some sort of a pop culture reference. And I think that is what separates it in addition to the masterful crafting of the movie itself makes it the most Edgar Wright. What do you think is the best Edgar Wright then? Probably Hot Fuzz. I think we agree on this, right? I, I think yeah. so too. I think it is the best Edgar Wright. Hot Fuzz was just so precise in its execution and it proved that his style didn't suffer when it was scaled up to a somewhat bigger film. If anything, it felt more refined. And his style of plant and payoff, it was established in Shaun of the Dead, but with Hot Fuzz, it felt like he could stretch his legs. Mm -hmm. It was a great matchup of sort of his British comedic sense set to the backdrop of American action films, which is a comedic premise in in and of itself. Shot in shot in the town that Edgar Wright grew up in. Yeah, exactly. And the, the grocery store that the he- The grocery store yeah. uh -huh, that he worked in that he has a cameo in. He used to be a, stock sh uh, a shelf stopper mm -hmm. in that grocery store. What is the derailed version of a of an Edgar Wright film? The World's End is. Yeah. And not just because I didn't like it the least, but this might be one of the reasons why I came out of The World's End disappointed. It is that it was too much referencing and looking back to the Cornetto trilogy. There yeah. were too many things that either they tried to bring back or they just seemed like they put in there because they would go, oh, yeah, you watched the first two. You'll like this. And that's where it felt, I don't want to say lazy, that's not fair, but just not as fresh. Yeah. And it was relying too much on the past. And so that's why it kind of felt arbitrary, again, isn't a word that I want to use, but just too much of the Cornetto trilogy in a way that I wish wasn't, which is an odd thing to say because I love them. Well, that's the thing is I think it was playing to his fan base in a sense. It it, it wasn't a widely consumable film. I, I don't think I would ever show World's End to someone who hasn't seen an Edgar Wright film because I wouldn't want that to be their introduction. No, it's it's definitely not the entry point. Give me your list one more time. Coming in at number five is The World's End. Number four, Scott Pilgrim versus The World. Number three, Baby Driver. Number two, Hot Fuzz, and number one, Shaun of the Dead. And I had different lists, more different than I... This is what I liked about this episode. We differed a lot more than I thought we were. I thought we were going to have the same list except for the top two. Yeah. I'm glad that we differed a little bit more than I thought. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it definitely does tell a lot about who we are as far as which ones appeal True. to us the most. Mm -hmm. So you had... I had... Uh, World's End at five, Baby Driver was four, Scott Pilgrim was three, Shaun of the Dead was two, and then I had Hot Fuzz as my favorite. 
But I will say we were very close in that numerically they only switched one place. <laughs> yeah. They're still hovering around the same threshold. Yeah. What film would you like to see Edgar Wright do? Either a genre or a specific film that you've seen in the past that you want to see his take on? That is a good question. Because his next film that he's doing or is completed but has been pushed back is not a comedy at all. Mm -hmm. It's got an interesting premise and it is kind of a high concept premise. It's called Last Night in Soho and it's a time travel type of movie where a girl who's a fashion designer just sort of mysteriously enters the 1960s. Cool. And she sort of travels back in time, but it's it's a thriller. It's apparently like a horror movie that he's doing. Mm -hmm. A time travel thriller is a really interesting leap for him. Yeah, I feel like it's the natural next genre for him to to tackle. Yeah. But as far as it not being primarily a comedy is interesting. Yeah. It almost feels as though it's impossible for it to be void of any That's comedy. what I thought. Because his, his style he's... is based in comedy. And he's such a great joke writer. Yeah. I mean, I would hate to not have an Edgar Wright movie with jokes in it. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem right, but maybe it'll be good. I don't know. That's the thing. I, I trust him so much. Uh, I'll watch anything that he's made. He's never let me down. Yeah. To answer your question, though, I want to see him do a sports movie because I think his sensibilities and his sense of movement within the camera yeah, yeah. would be an make for an incredible sports movie. It can't be something like baseball. It needs to be something that's very fast and very uh, free flowing. So something like hockey, something like soccer, something like basketball, yeah. any of those. And I don't think Edgar Wright's a big sports guy. Not that I know of. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe he likes soccer because, you know, people in Britain love soccer, but <laughs> it's called football. That's what I, it is called football. <laughs> You're right. It, but we have football too, American football. I want to see him do a football film. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Baby Driver is the only film that's set and shot in the United States. So it'd be kind of interesting yeah. to see him do a football film. <laughs> but yeah, what were but you saying? I want, to, I want to see him do some sort of a sports movie. For me, I would want to see him do an Indiana Jones type adventure. Oh, interesting. Okay. I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, Indiana Jones would be a lot of fun to see in his style. And I would love to see that because I want to see him with a really big budget. I want mm -hmm. to see what he can do with just all of it, with Transformers money. That's the thing is is sometimes it's a, I almost appreciate it when, when they don't have that much budget. I think Edgar Wright, his filmmaking, because he's made a lot of British kind of low budget films, has learned to focus so much on story. I think a lot of times once they are given too much of a budget, that's when they do head into those derailed type films uh, in, in the way that I think... Interstellar is probably Christopher Nolan's derailed film. I thought film. about Interstellar too. I said, I want Edgar Wright's Interstellar. A space, yeah, a space film just would be really go cool. go for it, man. Space Odyssey. Uh, but I think Indiana Jones just as an adventure film with Simon Pegg and, and Nick Frost. I, I, I don't mind if he brings the, both of those guys back. It would be so much fun. Do you know the video game Uncharted? Yeah. It's a very Indiana Jones-esque type story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give him Uncharted. Oh, that's actually very true. Mm-hmm. I think that would be incredible because I love those games and the games are just Tomb Raider, Indiana Jones, you know, adventure serial type of a, of a game. But I think it would be incredible. And it'd be smart on the game developers side because very few, if not any video game to film adaptations are very good. Well, you've never watched the nine movie, I mean, lineup of the Resident Evil movies cinema classics if there ever were any <laughs> dude i could not play those games growing up they would terrify me but uh yeah i think that, that wrap, about wraps up edgar wright right i think so yeah uh great films and i look forward to his next one time travel that's uh, actually really excites me set in the 60s i like that because we don't see the 60s a lot other than austin powers or men in black I was just looking at that scene again. That's true. They but, do go back to the 60s and men in black. I love, I was showing that scene to some friends because of the moment where Will Smith gets pulled over and he's like, and just because a black man's driving a nice car, it doesn't mean he stole it. Well, I stole this one, but it's yeah. not because I'm black. <laughs> just like, it's so great. But now we turn to our listeners. How would you rank Edgar Wright's films? 
What genre or existing film would you like to see in his style? Let us know on YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. You can find all those links on channel 8andahalf.com. That's channel 8 and a half, completely spelled out, dot com. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider liking and sharing with family and friends. We have new episodes every Thursday. Until next time, my name is Joe Galino. And I'm Andrew Hanna, and this is Channel 8 and a Half.